A new documentary, Resisterhood, is a powerful look at five diverse activists and a male congressman working tirelessly to bring a change and save our civil rights while motivating others to vote in the upcoming election. Director and producer Cheryl Jacobs Krim, known as CJ, started following these inspirational subjects soon after the election of Donald Trump in the fight for our democracy, specifically for women, LGBTQ, and civil rights. Margaret Morrison is one of her impressive subjects, and she's been in this fight since 1965 when she marched from Selma to Montgomery. Now 84 years old, she's still marching and not keeping quiet 55 years later. Listen as she describes her life as a longtime activist for women and African Americans. Uh, well, it's so inspiring to see you in this documentary. Uh, you've been at it uh, since 1965, or probably, probably even before that. Um, you marched on Selma. Um, so thank you for that. I mean, it's very, it's an honor to speak with you. Um, well, well, thank you. That's quite a compliment. I appreciate that. Well, no, I mean, to be going at it this long, and did you ever figure that, I'm sure it, it's been a, a long uphill battle, and it's, you know, it's never really stopped, right, for you? That is absolutely correct. In fact, over the years, you you finally learn that fighting injustices is a never-ending struggle. Right. And that our history tells us that, that simply when you think that something has been accomplished, and it has been, you take two steps back and you're still fighting the same problems uh, for centuries. And so you have to keep fighting, which is what I have attempted to do with my with my life. And when Obama was um, won the election and was uh, president of the United States, for me, I thought, I mean, I cried, <laughs> but I have not been around, you know, just mm -hmm. because I thought, never thought it would be possible. How about for you? Did you think it was a big leap? Did you even expect that there was going to be such a backlash? Did you feel some relief at the time? I felt... I felt two things all at the same time. I felt exhilaration because something unique had happened in the history of the United States of America that after from 17, well, since the inauguration of the first president, uh, George Washington, mm -hmm. hundreds of years had passed. Yeah. And there were, I guess in the history, there had been only two elected governorships there had been only three or four at that time of black senators in the United States Congress. And that's discounting the section of the, our history that was the Reconstruction period mm -hmm. when black men could vote. But, but so I felt exhilaration. But then after the event for both of his inaugurations, both of his elections, I looked at the statistics and realized that we had not overcome a lot because white women didn't vote for Obama mm. in massive numbers. It, it was less than 50%. And white men didn't vote for Obama. <laughs> it was less than 20%. Mm -hmm. And so when you think of those figures, you have to think that something else needs to give in order for every citizen in the United States to look at facts and based on facts, make a decision as to what they want to see in our government. Do we want to see integrity and morality or do we want to see power grabs so that the grabs that we have seen thus far, the power grabs that I have seen, especially during these almost four years of the, uh, the Republican control of Congress with, uh, with Trump as their leader, has been a deterioration of all of the institutions that define a representative democracy. And I can't figure out how those white men and women in the Senate, especially, can think that they're retaining their power is greater than talking about legislation that helps the entire United States, it helps the world, really. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about climate change. Of all of the issues facing us, why would trying to keep people from voting be a primary issue? Or why wouldn't one issue of voter, like a full abortion or gun rights, why would that dictate that they would let our institutions just crumble? And yet that's what I see within my, it's just, living day to day, they have permitted 
Trump, and not but just Trump, because Trump can't vote, yeah. but they have permitted him to defile our CIA, our FBI, our Justice Department, our pharmaceutical department. You name a department that helps to give structure and helps to give meaning to what we mean by representative democracy, and they have all, the integrity of every one of them has been compromised mm -hmm. to the point where I can't see in the foreseeable future any of these institutions regaining any kind of prominence. <laughs> and in a sense, it's so sort of ironic because all of my Black life, I have been trying to get those institutions to look at me as an individual, not just to look at my Blackness, but to look at my humaneness. Mm -hmm. And so I've been fighting because I thought they were hampering my progress, and they were. Mm -hmm. But now I find myself defending them. Yeah. <laughs> because it is just, it's more than just voting now. Mm -hmm. Because what, what have you gained when you have gained the right to vote, when there are no institutions that would even <laughs> need a vote because it would be author authoritarian. Oh, yeah. And that's where I see us going. So I've, it's, it's been disheartening. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's also been positive when I see young white people out on the streets with black people for the first time in my life, in some cases, outnumbering the number of black bodies and black faces that I see. Mm -hmm. And part of that, I believe, and I think others would say that I am correct, that it took the crucifixion of George Floyd and nine minutes of TV viewing to see that for some people, a black body has no meaning, has no worth, there is no humanity there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we had been in our homes because of COVID-19 that made a difference because so many people were able to view it with their own eyes as opposed to simply reading about it. But it must have struck a chord because there are so many people in every state of the United States rebelling against such brutality against a person who was only trying to breathe. Mm -hmm. However, in my history, what I saw was nothing different from what has gone on before. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's, it's a funny parallel that Selma, because there was TV crews there, the world got to see this. That is correct. And mm -hmm. it's almost the same thing here with George Floyd, that the world got to see what people have been fighting against, these injustices. So it's a, it's a funny parallel that it has to take, um, you know, a recorded piece of film or, or video as it is now. Correct. Mm -hmm. To open people's eyes out, up <clears throat> to what is really going on in this world. Right. I often wonder if we would had the technology when Emmett Till was... Um, murdered oh, in my 1954, might that have made a difference then? Mm -hmm. And I believe it would have. Oh, yeah. This George Ford's death makes a difference because you can actually, not only could you see it, you could almost internalize the feeling that was going on. You, it was like a trauma that was occurring to you also, not just to this Black man. Mm -hmm. It was a life uh, being snuffed out. Correct, correct. And so, but yeah, I did start, um, I did do the march, not from Selma to Montgomery. My group ended up there the early morning hours of that last day of March 25th. It was a Thursday. Mm -hmm. And I recall I made that decision a couple of weeks prior to that when I saw the television coverage of what came to be known as Bloody Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I saw the dogs being put on kids, and no matter what age, the young people, the old people, the water hoses, the batons, the beating of these bodies. And 
one of the faces I saw on the ground on that television station was um, the face of John Lewis. Oh, yeah. Now, I had not gone to the 1963 March on Washington, but I remembered him. I knew his face because I remembered looking at the, the videos of him later at the March on Washington. I thought, what a brave soul he is. <laughs> so when I saw that same image again, that same person on the ground being beaten, I remember I was living in Chicago at the time. I remember turning to my husband and said, you know, I'm ready to die for this cause. This cannot, we cannot continue to live in a, in a country where this is how they treat black people. And um, I was lucky enough to be able to get a space on a small airplane. And so I did join the march that Thursday, early Thursday morning. And it was one of the most profound and moving experiences of my life. Uh, there were people on jeering us as we marched down the street. There were people applauding us. There were some who were simply silent, who were looking. But when we actually walked into the space of the, of the Capitol in Montgomery, Alabama, there were so many people, all of us, jovial, smiling, laughing, singing. The speeches were simply exhilarating. And so we thought we had accomplished so much. And in a sense, we had. Mm -hmm. um, it did lead to the 1965 Civil Rights Act that uh, President Johnson signed, which reminds me of that same act permitted my parents I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. That act permitted my parents to vote for the first time in their lives. My father was 65 and my mother was seven years younger. And for the first time in their lives, they were given the right to vote. And why was that? Because of the Jim Crow laws. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned get out and vote. You know, there are people, even now, celebrities who are asking why like Biden should get our vote, or people are still saying, why should we go out and vote? Even some of my Latino family members in 2016 were like, well, it doesn't make a difference. I wanted to smack them um, because they said that, because they think it doesn't make a difference. So what do you say to those voters who think it doesn't matter if I vote or not, nothing's gonna change? Well, that's a fallacy that has been around for so long that people truly believe that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm hoping that when if people see the documentary, and listen to what this disparate group of people who, in the end, are the protagonists in this documentary, they will understand that if a person does not vote in a representative democracy, anything can happen that destroys what is a democracy. And I believe, I simply, I, I, I have so much hope that more people's eyes have awakened to the possibilities of, a, of a, the destruction of our democracy that they are willing to vote. The other thing that is so problematic, some people take a, a, a slogan like, oh, they're the t lesser of two evils. Yeah. Now, when was Hillary Clinton's evil mm -hmm. the same as Trump's evil? Right. Or when has the evil of Biden been the evil like Trump's. It's, a, it's something that if you say something often enough, mm -hmm. people tend to believe it. They tend to believe it. They tend to believe that Biden is old and fumbling and a fool. Because why? Over and over and over, the Republican Party and 45 have stressed that. Yep. And there is no way in the world for a person to look at two facts, two, two people, and face the fact that no, one is not like the other. So why should you vote? I hope the documentary is saying that you should vote because you matter and your vote matters. You should vote because people in the opposite party know that. Otherwise, they wouldn't try to discourage you from voting. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't put so many obstacles in your way to voting. That's a sure sign that something about a vote means power. 
And no matter how you think that you don't have power, you'd be surprised at how that one simple act of voting, one person after the other person, millions of us after the millions of us, in the end, are the winners. We can take back our country. We have to take back our country if we want a democracy to work. And I believe the typical person does indeed want to live in a democratic society mm -hmm. as opposed to an autocratic one. And so I, I think the resist, the Resisterhood documentary points out that, that um, you matter, your vote matters, both matters, and you can't have one without the other. So if you, if you know who you are and you know that you are a person of substance and that you do matter, then we are encouraging you to get out and vote. And I, believe there, yeah, I believe there are so few people who are undecided personally. I think people have made up their minds. Yeah, they just don't want to say out loud. <laughs> Correct, right. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, you have an Obama room. It's pretty amazing that we <laughs> see in the <laughs> in your house. Yeah, that, but for the first inauguration, I had relatives and friends coming from uh, all different places. And my home is not a large home, but they didn't care. They were, you, you probably, you would have stepped on people. There were so many in my house. Mm -hmm. And as each came, they brought me a newspaper from where they were coming from or a magazine. And when they went back home, they sent me other artifacts. And so what do you do with all of these artifacts, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so in the end, there's a little space in that was, that I decided, well, yeah. Some of the posters, you didn't see all of them, but some of the posters, they too were gifts. And of course I had purchased items. So I had some framed, I still have some rolled up, but the typical item that you see in there was given to me primarily by nieces, nephews, sisters, and friends who had come and, and spent uh, several days with me during both inaugurations. And I, and I made scrapbooks. You did not see that in the uh, the resisterhood. You only mm -hmm. saw my family scrapbooks. But I have a scrapbook that's the, the 2008 election. Mm -hmm. It goes for four years. And I have the second scrapbook, uh, 2012, that goes for four years. That's and if I, may, if I may claim, in one of the, in, uh, I guess the second scrapbook, I have a personal letter from uh, the Attorney General, uh, Eric Holder. Mm -hmm. Because here again, not only do I write missiles to my family, when something is a miss or when I want to applaud somebody, I write to my congresspersons and, uh, and others. And on this particular occasion, I had written to uh, 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 Attorney General Eric Holder, and he was kind enough to respond. Oh. I made it so meaningful. He ended his letter. He said, well, thank you, Mrs. Morrison. When things are tough or well, gotten exactly the word, he say, I will remember your letter and remember your comments. And I thought, that, how wonderful. That, oh, you sweet. Know, yeah. That, and it was not a form letter. It was because a lot of times you go to just a form letter. But, mm -hmm. but this one was, was specifically from him to me personally. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so and do you have a name for your, your Obama? Do you call it Obama Cave? Obama Central? I, I just call it the... Actually, Cheryl Krim started that the Obama room. I just didn't, I didn't call it anything. Oh. <laughs> anything that was Obama ended up mm -hmm. in that. I could, see, I could see why she called it the Obama room. So I started calling it the Obama room. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing that was interesting, the same niece who is uh, Dallas's mother, uh, her husband has a relationship with a young man who is friends to uh, the John Lewis family. Oh. And so for over the years, they've done picnics together. So in December of 2016, my, hop, my Christmas gift from them, they said, well, we're going to take you to meet John Lewis in person. And all of us assumed that it would be in his office uh, downtown. And instead, that December, he hosted us at his home. So I had a chance not only to just sit and chat and talk with him, but to take pictures with him. Uh, so that was, that was really the, one of the highlights of my life, to, to know this icon and to, to personally uh, be a part of his, um, 
well, just a part of sitting at his home, chatting with him. Um, it has been great talking to you. Um, I really admire that you've done this for such a long time. Um, and hopefully in your lifetime, we'll see something happen. I mean, I think it's happening now, but I hope I, real change comes. Right. right. I, I hope so too. And I see, I feel it in my bones that something good is going to come out of something that has been so horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but yeah, but I appreciate those like you who understand the significance of trying to encourage people to get out and vote. Because if we just simply sit in our homes or, and do nothing, we have contributed nothing to advancing yep. the union. And, and so, but so thank you. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Take care. You too now. All right. Bye-bye. Resistorhood is now on Amazon Prime Video and on Video On Demand. 